guests and colleagues. Uh, as the coordinator of the ITU Natural Language Processing Group, I'm truly delighted to stand before you today to extend a warm and heartfelt welcome to our esteemed invited speaker, Professor Joachim Nivre. Uh, Professor Nivre is a renowned expert in natural language processing and computational linguistics. And we feel incredibly fortunate to have him join us for this sem seminar. His extensive knowledge, uh, what makes this seminar particularly special is the researchers from various universities across Turkey and professionals from industry, all united by our shared curiosity and passion for natural language processing. Our seminar today serves as a platform for the exchange of ideas, the exploration of new horizons, and the strengthening, strengthening of our collective knowledge. Uh, Joachim has a lot to share with us, and I'm confident that his presentation will be both enlightening and thought-provoking. Uh, before I invite Professor Nivre to the stage, I would like to take a moment to express our deep appreciation for his willingness to be with, here with us today. Thank you so much. <laughs> to be here and looking forward uh, to talking to you about uh, universal dependencies which is a project that has uh, where, where I've been involved for almost 10 years now and I welcome this opportunity to reflect a bit on the current state of things uh, how did we get here uh, where exactly are we uh, and maybe towards the end also a few thoughts about where we might want to go in the future uh, but first of all um, since not everyone may be familiar with universal dependencies uh, what is it well if you go to the uh, UD website uh, you will be told that it's a project developing cross-linguistically consistent tree bank annotation for many languages, with the goal of facilitating multilingual parser development, cross-lingual learning, and parsing research from a language typology perspective. And I think this is a fairly accurate description of the project, at least at the time when it started. Uh, but uh, over the 10 years, it has evolved in various ways. And I would uh, say that today, it's more than a project. It's also an annotation scheme uh, a data repository, and I would argue by now a kind of research community. And I intend to touch upon all these three aspects in the talk, and I will begin by way of introduction of saying something briefly about each one of them, and then I will come back and talk about each one also in more detail. So starting with the annotation scheme, which of course is very central because it's all about uh, linguistic annotation uh, of, of many languages. Now, 
Uh, very simply, uh, the two basic design principles of the UD annotation is, first of all, that it takes words as the basic units, which is, as we will see, uh, challenging in itself, but that's the idea. And then uh, it, we build representations using binary syntactic relations connecting words uh, and try to do this in a uh, consistent way across many different languages. Uh, uh, an important decision at the start of the project was to not start from scratch but try to build on existing de facto standards at the time uh, which means that the part of speech tag set is sort of derived from uh, the Google universal part of speech tag set. Uh, the system of morphological features is based on the Interset Interlingua developed in Prague and the uh, taxonomy of syntactic relations is inherited from the Stanford type dependencies, although they have all been sort of revised in various ways. And I think with hindsight, this was a wise decision and I think it has contributed to the wide acceptance uh, of, of the framework. Now, the UD repository has uh, grown in ways that uh, none of us could imagine when we started. Uh, and in the latest uh, release uh, in May this year. Uh, we had data from 30 language families, 141 languages, 245 tree banks because many languages by now have more than one tree bank. Uh, and this of course has only been possible thanks to the amazing contributions by over 500 uh, researchers around the world. And altogether, this now comprises almost 2 million sentences and over 30 million words. Uh, when it comes to the community, it's sort of very loosely structured. But at the center, inevitably, there is this group of people called the Universal Guidelines Group, which uh, is responsible for maintaining the Universal Guidelines. Uh, and also for responsible for data validation and for releases of data. And although it has changed a little bit over the years, it mostly consists of people who uh, founded uh, the project at the beginning. Now, uh, equally important uh, is the larger group of tree bank developers, the 500 plus people that I've already sort of acknowledged, uh, who then are responsible for uh, their uh, individual data sets or tree banks and also for uh, the language specific documentation uh, that goes with these tree banks and that is equally important. Uh, but by now there is also this even larger um, group of people uh, which is uh, <clears throat> which we know less about because we don't know exactly who downloads the data. People who use these resources for various things, both research and technical development. And I'll try to uh, say a little bit uh, towards the end about what goes on in this larger community as well. Now, before that, uh, I want to. Um, uh, I can't resist, I should rather say, the temptation to take a little stroll down memory lane and uh, tell you uh, the history of UD and how it started, including actually a fairly big chunk of prehistory, which I, has uh, some relevance to understanding why UD today looks the way it is. Um, and I'm sure there are many uh, ways of telling this history, but for me personally, this all started in 2006. Uh, with the first uh, Connell shared task on multilingual dependency parsing, where uh, I had the privilege of collaborating with Professor Eriot uh, uh, in, in our contribution. But I, here I also want to take the opportunity to acknowledge the enormous debt that our community owns, uh, owes to these four people who are, uh, are not very famous today in dependency parsing. So Sabina, Amit, Yuval, and Ervin were the organizers of this first sh shared task. And they uh, did a major achievement at the time. They managed to collect tree dependency tree banks for no less than 13 languages, which was an amazing uh, achievement at the time, and also came up with this standardized data format for representing them, the Connell X format, which of course UD has also inherited. Now, at about the same time, we also saw uh, the launch of the 
Stanford type dependencies coming out of Stanford with Marie de Marneff and Chris Manning as the, the major contributors. Uh, this was not really an annotation scheme, at, at least not at the time. It was rather a representation that was to be, uh, so in those days, at least for English, most parsers produced phrase structure representations. But people have found that for certain nat natural language understanding applications, it was more useful to have dependency representations. So this was basically a, a, a conversion from phrase structure trees to a particular type of dependency representations. Now, uh, next step, uh, the following year, my uh, longstanding collaborator, collaborator Ryan McDonald and I uh, wrote a paper where we wanted to make a comparative error analysis of all the systems that had competed in the uh, shared task of previous years. And one of the things we wanted to do was compare how well different systems dealt with different linguistic um, uh, constructions in different languages. Uh, and it turned out that this was extremely difficult to do because even though the data had been standardized in one sense in the Connell X format, every tree bank still had its own guidelines, its own set of categories. So we managed by carefully re reaching the guidelines of all the 13 tree banks, come up with some coarse categories that we could map to. You can, if you can read it here, it's verb, noun, pronoun, adjective, just six or seven part of speech categories so that we could do the analysis. Uh, but this was one of the points where I clearly saw the need for having something that is sort of consistent across languages that allows comparison. Now, uh, at about the same time, my colleague Dan Zeman in Prague uh, approached the same problem, but in a more principled way, I would say, by developing this um, uh, so-called um, inter, sorry, interset interlingua which is, as it says here, a nearly universal set of features uh, that you can use to map different tag sets uh, from and to different part of speech tag sets. So it's another way of, of making sure that you can compare part of speech uh, categories across languages. Now, uh, a few years later, <coughs> researchers at Google, including Ryan, uh, then launched this uh, universal part of speech tag set, in, including 12 categories, which was actually based on the old error analysis that we had done in 2007, but they added a few categories and again, took a more principled approach to it. Now, meanwhile, uh, Dan and his colleagues in Prague had taken this one step further uh, and tried to harmonize not only part of speech categories, but also uh, full dependency trees, syntactic representations in this uh, uh, Hamlet collection of tree banks where they harmonized tree banks with different annotation uh, schemes essentially by converting them all to a version of the Prague dependency tree bank uh, scheme. Uh, uh, again, uh, a year later, uh, together with colleagues at Google where I was on sabbatical, uh, we uh, uh, recognized that people had started using the Stanford dependencies for different languages, but in doing so, they created different dialects of Stanford dependencies. So they were not really compatible after all. So we proposed this, um, well, in this paper called uh, Universal Dependency Annotation for Multilingual Parsing, we proposed a, a standardization of that. And I'm very happy to uh, tell you that we, um, earlier this year, we actually got a uh, an ACL test of time award for this paper, uh, for which we're very grateful. Now, this immediately prompted a reaction from our colleagues in Stanford, in particular, again, Marie de Marneff and Chris Manning, who sort of liked the idea of a universal Stanford dependencies, but didn't quite like some of the decisions that we had made. And eventually, I got hijacked into uh, being a co-author of this paper that proposed the universal Stanford dependencies. And at this point, some of us said, okay, now we need to get together. Uh, stop developing these alternative universal schemes. Try to sit down uh, around um, a table and uh, agree on something. Uh, and, and, and that's what we did. So later in 2014, uh, we issued the first uh, version of the guidelines of universal dependencies, which then in some way integrates the universal Stanford dependencies uh, the Google Universal Party Speech Tags and the Interset 
uh, morphological features, although all of them have been sort of revised in various ways. Now, uh, in January uh, the following year, uh, we had the first release of data, so it was only um, 10 languages, uh, 10 tree banks, uh, and, uh, 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 but it was uh, the first sort of milestone. In 2016, uh, we had the second release of the guidelines where we tried to fix the most obvious mistakes in the first version. Uh, and then 2017 turned out to be a really uh, productive year for universal dependencies. This is a slide that I've taken from the um, first UD workshop, a new workshop series that has been running ever since. Uh, and uh, in, we also had a tutorial at EACL, uh, but probably more importantly, uh, we saw the first, the organization of the first of two Connell shared tasks on uh, multilingual parsing from raw text to universal dependencies, which was very similar in spirit to the uh, first Connell shared task in 2006, but now you had the same annotation scheme for all languages. And here is a graphic, it's hard to read, but you can uh, look at it in the paper that my colleague Philip Ginter from Turku uh, created that tries to uh, visualize the impacts of these two shared tasks by plotting on the x-axis the amount of uh, labeled data that is available for a language and on the y-axis the best uh, parsing accuracy achieved for that language. So every pair of dots here is a language and shows the state before and after these shared tasks in terms of amount of data and accuracy. So you can see that uh, uh, all languages improved at least along one of these dimensions and most of them improved uh, along both dimensions. Now, um, in 2020, uh, we reached the uh, important milestone of having more than 100 languages in UD. We also saw uh, the launch of two other shared tasks uh, collocated with the IWPT, the parsing conference. Uh, this time focusing parsing into enhanced dependencies, which is this richer representation uh, that is available only for a subset of the languages in UD. Uh, and then last year uh, we um, introduced some new policies that I will briefly return to later on. Uh, but this is sort of the journey uh, that we've, we've traveled uh, over, well, over actually more than 10 years then. So uh, with that as background, I wanted to, uh, for those of you who are not uh, super familiar with this, give, go into a little more detail in explaining the basic principles of the UD annotation scheme. So, um, as I already emphasized, the sort of basic, the, the, the basic goal of, of the whole UD project is to uh, try to achieve cross-linguistically consistent morphosyntactic annotation so that we can compare uh, annotations or whatever we want to compare across languages uh, and not be misled by accidental differences in the representation. And this, of course, is meant to support research uh, uh, for on many languages uh, from the start, primarily in NLP. But as we have found out, and that I will also talk about later, uh, more and more these resources have also started to be used for uh, ling uh, linguistic research of various kinds. I already mentioned that we took the decision to try to build this on what was common usage and existing de facto standards at the time uh, in order to sort of facilitate um, acceptance by the community. And um, I also want to still want to emphasize uh, the point, uh, a point that I often make, although I'm not sure we succeed here, uh, that I see UD really as a complement, not a replacement of language specific schemes. Because if you want to do cross linguistic comparison, you have to abstract a bit. So inevitably, you lose some of the finer details of individual languages. So if you're really interested in sort of the fine details of one or a few languages, 
UD may not be the ideal uh, representation format. So uh, I still sort of try to encourage people to if, uh, use all the sort of detailed annotation that they want for their language, but make sure that from those representation you can extract a UD representation, because that is also sensible if you want to make cross-linguistic comparison. So that's sort of, there's a fine balance here. But I think, in, to be completely honest, in, 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 some, in some cases, I think UD, we've sort of been the victim of our own success because people see, okay, we want to do UD, and, and if, if that's all you do for a language, then, uh, but it's, it's, it, it can still be a good start, of course. Uh, so the basic philosophy that we started out with was this idea of maximize maximizing parallelism be between languages. So what we mean by that was simply that if two languages actually have the same construction, it should look the same in the annotation, which wasn't the case when you had sort of these uh, pre-existing conflicting annotation. And equally important, if um, people had sort of different ways of expressing something, it shouldn't accidentally look the same because you had made this. So, Try to make things as similar as possible between languages, but also don't overdo it because, of course, languages are different and have different structural characteristics. And in particular, we used to have this slogan, don't annotate things that don't exist just because they exist in other languages, which is something we've also seen. So the, the sort of broad goal is something like a universal taxonomy with room for language-specific elaboration, uh, which... Um, and so that's sort of the starting point. And I already mentioned sort of the two um, um, basic design principles. So one was the choice to um, base the syntactic annotation on dependency or at least binary syntactic relations rather than let's say constituency representations or other alternatives. Uh, and the, the motivation was on the one hand that it was at the time widely used in NLP systems. So that was also something which uh, we could gain acceptance for. And it was already available in tree banks for many languages at the time, which could then more easily be converted. Uh, but it's important to keep in mind that the UD notion of dependency doesn't always coincide with what some theoretical schools of dependency uh, would uh, dictate. And I will come back to that. Uh, now, the second uh, basic design principle is what we sometimes refer to as a version of lexicalism. Uh, or, uh, but in this context, what it primarily means is that we take the basic annotation units to be words, not, for example, morphemes, because we think that words uh, are more uh, sort of universally generalizable, although they are still quite challenging. So the basic idea is that Words have morphological properties, and they may be realized. Uh, some languages have more morphology, some has less, and the way in which morphologically is realized, segmentally or, or fusion, also varies. But we can capture these properties in a morphological layer across all languages. And words then enter into syntactic relations with other words, and that we can capture in a syntactic layer. So that's sort of the basic idea. Now, uh, uh, as I already hinted, uh, this idea of recognizing what is a word in a language uh, and to come up with universal criteria for doing that has turned out to be one of the most challenging aspects of UD uh, and, and one that we're still working on. Uh, and one that I, yeah. So, um, and I, here we have to be sort of honest and say that we, really haven't come up with very good criteria. And of course, some linguists would say that it's impossible uh, to come up with universal criteria. But the, the, the basic heuristic that we uh, sort of try to use as guidance is that, a first of all, a word should have a single part of speech type. So if you're looking at some element and say, hmm, this is a determiner, but it also has the function of a preposition, right? then that's probably not one word, that's two words, and you need to somehow split it. But a word should also have a real syntactic relation. So if all, if all you can say about a segment is that, hmm, it's an inflection of some stem, 
then it's probably also not a word, but rather an affix. Um, and, but uh, the, we realize that uh, um, the, the linguistically informed notion of word that we want to capture here doesn't always coincide with what you get from a deterministic tokenizer for a language. So UD allows this two-level segmentation where in addition to the syntactic words, which are the basic annotation units, we can also represent orthographic tokens uh, when they are different from words. So to give you a, a couple of examples, and of course, ideally I should have had some Turkish examples here because Turkish is, is one of the languages that uh, uh, is, is quite tricky in this respect. I didn't dare put in those examples because I'm sure I would get them wrong. So you will have to, uh, uh, live with, uh, with some other languages for illustration here, but I'll be happy to, to talk to you all about it afterwards. So here's an example from French. What is written as a single uh, token in French, uh, O, A-U-X, of course, it, it, not of course, but is the fusion of a preposition and an article. And since those perform different syntactic functions, in the annotation we want to represent uh, the fact that there are two different words here. Similar in Spanish, give it to me is by convention written without spaces in Spanish, uh, even though linguistically it's a verb in imperative form and two pronouns, me and it, right? So again, we, need to, we want to recognize the fact that there are three different words here. Hebrew is a language that uses spaces, like many sort of uh, words written in er e European alphabet, but tends to put more between the spaces than in traditional European languages. So this string here, uh, my um, Israeli colleagues tell me, means something like, and that in the sun, read from right to left. Uh, and, and again, in order to do a linguistically plausible analysis here, we need to recognize the fact that this string is five linguistic words, not one, right? And then, of course, there are many languages that don't use spaces at all. This is Japanese, Osaka Convention Center. Uh, and, uh, and, and here it's, uh, again, my Japanese colleague uh, tell me and they debate sort of how to recognize words in Japanese because it's quite uh, difficult. So again, UD doesn't give the solution to all this problem, but it provides a framework where you can represent uh, sort of both these levels. All right, moving on to, morpho to the morphological layers. Um, if we have uh, identified the words, plus things like punctuation that we also may want to include, here's an example from French, le chat chasse les chiens, the cat chases the dogs. Uh, so the first thing that we uh, uh, have in the morphological layer is a lemma. So representing the base form of each word. Uh, and this of course is uh, by necessity language specific. So UD doesn't have very much to say about this except that it provides a, a, a slot for it in the annotation. Uh, we then uh, assign to each element a part of speech tag representing its grammatical class. And this is uh, sort of where we enter the annotation scheme because this uh, part of speech tag then comes from this uh, revised and extended version of the Google universal part of speech tags that currently uh, consists of 17 different categories, which can be broadly divided into open class uh, words like noun, verbs, adjectives, and so on, and closed class words like adpositions, which generalizes across prepositions and postpositions, auxiliaries, coordinating conjunction, subordinating conjunction, and so on, and then some special tags for things like punctuation and symbols, and the X tag, which you can use if you really have no idea what something is, uh, and of course, ideally, should not be used at all or to a minimum. And this is a fixed inventory, at least for a given version of UD. So you cannot invent language-specific uh, categories, but not, not all languages have to use all of these tags. So for example, if a language doesn't have a grammaticalized distinction between common nouns and proper nouns, you can just use noun as the single category. But of course, for, for um, many languages, and again, Turkish would be a very good example, just using these 15, 17 part of speech tag would give a very crude uh, coarse grained 
morphological analysis. And that's why, in addition to this, uh, we, you can also add uh, features representing either lexical or grammatical properties of either a lemma or a particular uh, inflected form of the lemma. And this comes from a much larger inventory uh, where um, of these are universal features, universal only in the sense that you don't have to declare them, they are part of the framework. But for each feature, you may have uh, language-specific values, because things like case, uh, the number of cases, and uh, what, how, how the distinctions are made are not the same in all languages that have, that have case inflection. Uh, but in addition to having language-specific values for features, you can also add language-specific features. And if they then happen to occur in several languages, they will eventually be uh, sort of integrated into the universal set. So this is a, 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 um, an inventory that is growing in that sense. OK, uh, so uh, moving on. Uh, when we come to syntax, uh, which I will illustrate with an English example, the cat could have chased all the dogs down the street. Um, the uh, I already said that it's based on dependency or binary syntactic relations, but there is this uh, special flavor of dependency that UD uses uh, given the goal of maximizing parallelism across languages. So the basic idea is that UD prioritizes direct relations between content words, that is verbs, nouns, adjectives, and adverbs, basically. So if we have in this sentence, we say that the core is the main predicate chaste, a verb, and it has a nominal subject where the most important word is cat, it has a direct object where the most important word is dogs, and it has a, a so-called oblique or mo locative modifier where the most important word is street. Uh, function words are then attached to the content words uh, that they modify. So determiners go with nouns, auxiliaries, uh, whether they are verbal or nonverbal, go with uh, verbs. Uh, and even um, a preposition in English like down here is essentially treated as a case marker on the noun rather than uh, as a, the head of a prepositional phrase, which would be a more traditional analysis, analysis in syntactic theory. And that's perhaps the most, well, it's one of the two most controversial uh, aspects of, of UD syntax uh, that some syntacticians don't really like. But it's motivated, well, I, I, will, I will show another slide where I try to motivate why in this context it could still be a good idea. And if you want to include punctuation uh, in the annotation, there are guidelines for doing that too. So just to sort of um, motivate this idea of, of maximizing parallelism by prioritizing direct relations between content word, Here's an example uh, in English, the dog was chased by the cat. In Swedish, my native language, hunden jagade av katten, and in Czech, which I will not try to pronounce, uh, but uh, with the same meaning. And the observation here is simply this, that if you take these uh, direct relations between content words, then uh, you see that these actually have a parallel structure. There is a passive predicate, there is a uh, passive subject, the, thing be, uh, the entity being chased in this case, and there is um, an oblique or agent modifier expressing the agent of the relation. Now, what differs between these languages is that, for example, definiteness uh, is a grammatical category that in English is expressed by a separate function word. In Swedish is expressed by a morphological inflection and in Czech is not grammaticalized at all, and therefore sort of not uh, part of the annotation. Uh, sim similarly, the uh, passive uh, is in English a periphrastic construction involving an auxiliary and a participle. It is in Swedish, again, a morphological inflection, and in Czech it's actually a combination because there is a, uh, an auxiliary but the particular participle that is used here is only used in the passive. It's not a general past participle. And finally, when it comes to this agent phrase, uh, in uh, English and Swedish, uh, it's encoded with the help of a preposition. 
but in Czech it's instead encoded using a uh, morphological case, the instrumental cases. So uh, there, there is a taxonomy then of 37 uh, universal relations. I will not have time to go through them. Uh, there are, they are of course documented in, in the annotation guidelines. Uh, but it's, it's important to mention again that there, there is also the possibility of having language specific subtypes. Uh, but the idea is still that, uh, so if you, if you think, feel that a, an important grammatical distinction is lost, if you uh, can only use these 37, you can make finer distinctions introducing subtypes. But the idea is that uh, any language specific relation should always be a subtype of a universal relation so that you can back off to the universal relations for cross-linguistic comparison. Okay, uh, that sort of concludes the um, tour, if you like, of the annotation guidelines. I now wanted to say uh, a few words about uh, the current state of the UD repository and the resources that are available there. This is a slide that you've already seen. It has some very nice, impressive numbers in it. Uh, and uh, but I also want to point out some things that you, ne you need to be aware of if you want to use these uh, resources. Now, first is the distribution of data across language families. I mean, it's, I think it's inevitable, given the state of languages in the world and, 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 and politics and all the rest, that any such collection will, uh, most, will, will have a majority of Indo-European languages. Still. The distribution has uh, improved uh, quite a lot over time. In the first release, there were 80% in the European languages. I think we're now at 48 or something like that. It's less than 50 anyway. Uh, it's not, the bias is not going to, to go away, but it's getting uh, better. So we now have other, there are seven Turkic languages, for example, and, and some other language families. But, and hopefully it will get even better over time. Similarly, if you look inside the Indo-European family, you also see that it's quite bi biased. Slavic, Germanic, and Romans have always been sort of the, the, the branches uh, with the most languages. But even here, uh, it, it seems to become more even over time. So in that sense, it's looking nice. But what you can't see from a diagram from this is how big the tree banks are. So here is a plot of the it's of course impossible to see, but here are all the 100, no sorry, the 240 something tree banks uh, and their size. And you can see that there are a few really big ones. The biggest one being this uh, tree bank for German with almost 3.5 million words. But most of them are not even visible uh, on this. They are really small and the median size of a UD tree bank has actually decreased over time as new languages have been added and it's down to uh, uh, below 30,000 words. Now s s these small tree banks can still be extremely valuable. Uh, for many languages they are probably the first annotated corpus that exists uh, and, and of course the hope is that over time they can also be extended. But it's important to be aware that for some of the traditional use cases of UD, like training parsers, for example, uh, some of the tree banks are uh, currently uh, not very usable. So I, I see that as one of the sort of most important goals for UD uh, as, a, as a project going forward, not only getting more languages, we always want more languages, but at this point, I would say it's, it's maybe even more important that we can get more data for the languages that we have. Um, here is another way of, of, of visualizing this problem, thanks to Frank Tires. Uh, I hope it's visible. So in this, every dot is a language, and this an approximate sort of position on the map where it, the language is spoken. Of course, some languages are spoken in many places. But the color of the dot uh, signifies the amount of data available for that language, with dark blue being large and light green being small. Right? And here we see that there is actually a, a, a very strong European bias here. Not only you have more dots in this area than anywhere else on the map, but you also have all the most of the darker dots here. Uh, Turkish is relatively okay, I think, compared to many other here. 
All right. Uh, another way in which the resources are, or the data is skewed, is the type of text that you have in the data. So here, we don't have, unfortunately, very detailed information about these. All the tree bank providers are asked to specify in a simple readme file what text genres are represented in the data, not the exact amount. So this graph just tells you how many tree banks contain some amount of news texts, and that's almost all of them, right? And then for these other categories, which are clearly overlapping, so this is uh, not, not a very exact taxonomy, but we see that, that there is a long tail of, so for example, if you're, if you're interested in poetry, uh, there is not a lot of data that you can find. Uh, if you're interested in legal text, you're doing slightly better and, and, and so on. So I think it's important to, to be aware of this, that it's nice to have all resources for all these languages, but there are uh, sort of biases uh, and, and, and weaknesses in, in, in the data sets. All right, so uh, the final thing uh, I would like to do before I conclude is then to go back to what I refer to as the UD research community and try to get some kind of picture, and this was uh, to a large extent driven by my own curiosity, about what are people actually doing uh, with these UD resources. And the way I tried to do that was to do a simple literature survey using uh, Google Scholar. Um, so everything has to be taken with a pinch of salt here, uh, but I think the broad uh, strokes can probably be trusted. So what I did was I searched for uh, any uh, publication that contains the exact phrase universal dependencies anywhere in the article. Uh, and after manually expecting uh, a few thousand articles, this is actually more exact than I expected. So, uh, and if you just run the query for different years, here is the pattern that you get. And of course we know in Google Scholars, the actual numbers cannot be trusted because there are things in here that are not proper publications and so on. But I think again, the sort of the overall trends. So what we see is, uh, is a, a steady increasing trend in publications that for one reason or the other refers to universal dependencies. Possibly with the beginning of a sort of plateau here. We'll, we'll have to see what happens. Now, I then, but of course, uh, this doesn't tell us anything about what the papers are about. So then what I did was I went through manually uh, a sample of 20% of all the papers published in each year. Uh, so a total of about uh, um, 1,300 papers. Um, I should stress that this is not a random sample. It was the top 20% in the Google Scholar ranking, and I don't know what that ranking is uh, based on. I think if universal dependencies appears in the title, that is something that makes it ranked high, but there were many of the papers that I looked at that did not have UD or universal dependencies in the title. And I then tried to classify these, it, again, in some broad categories, and see. And the first one in blue uh, are papers that talk about universal guidelines tools or frameworks. And that could be either the UD um, guidelines themselves or alternative proposals for uh, doing this. And this is a relatively stable category uh, that seems to be still existing over time. The second category in green are papers about language-specific guidelines or tree banks. So the prototypical paper in this category is a paper entitled uh, UD tree bank of X, where X is often a language that may not have had a tree bank before. And this seems to be a quite healthy category. It seems to be growing, and in fact, last year it was the biggest of these categories. So it seems that people are still interested in annotating language data in UD and writing papers about it, which I take to be encouraging. The third category in yellow are papers about in particular morphosyntactic, but I've also included semantic parsing. So in some sense, maybe the application that UD was uh, originally de defined for, training and evaluating parsers using the morphological and syntactic representations in UD. And this has over time been the most important category. It got a big boost in 2017 with the first Connell shared task. And it, it then has uh, 
been the largest category, but last year uh, it uh, actually started to decrease. And this probably doesn't come as uh, any surprise for people who have followed the general development in the field of NLP, where uh, people typically these days do not d develop NLP systems by building traditional pipelines that do morphological analysis and tactic analysis, but rather use uh, large language models that are pre-trained and fine-tuned and prompted and so on. So this is probably uh, the beginning of a trend that we will see continue. Doesn't mean that parsing is not interesting anymore. There's, uh, it's interesting for lots of reasons, but it's not in the mainstream of NLP in the way that it was uh, when the project started. Downstream NLP tasks is another broad category where people, for some reason, use either UD resources or tools trained on UD resources to improve downstream NLP tasks. And this is a category that came a little later and maybe and quite probably is also uh, starting to decrease because this is not how uh, people build sort of these systems anymore. On the other hand, uh, the category of linguistic research, which is papers that use UD resources not to do NLP, but to uh, study some aspect of linguistics. And typically, uh, it's linguistic typology that people are interested in. That is a category that is uh, still increasing and actually in last year was as big as or even slightly bigger than the parsing category. Uh, and finally, I couldn't resist including also papers, even though it's a small category, uh, that use UD resources for interpretability studies typically trying to understand how large language models work by doing probing. And of course, especially if you're working with multilingual models and want to do this for many languages, uh, there are not man that many other resources that can be used. Uh, so we'll see whether this is a category that will continue to increase or not. So uh, finally, I'll very quickly, to make this a little more concrete, uh, give you some snapshots of this development. So one paper from each year. In 2014, uh, the selection is obviously somewhat limited. So I took this paper that presented the universal Stanford dependencies and that introduced uh, some of the more controversial aspects of the dependency syntax. One of them is copula construction, like Ivan is the best dancer, where UD insists on not treating the verb is as the head of the clause but rather than nonverbal predicate dancer in order to make the annotation parallel to languages like Russian, for example, where often there is no copula verb. And the other one I've always mentioned, it's the decision to treat all kinds of ad positions as case markers rather than as heads of prepositional phrases, which, as some of you may remember, was not part of the original Stanford. Uh, a paper by uh, my colleague uh, Jörg Tiedemann on cross-lingual parsing. So this is, a, in a way, is the prototypical use case for UD, at least early on. So training parsers on some languages and then applying them on other languages and making use of the universal representation. Here he compared the, what was at the time, the standard approaches to cross-lingual parsing, namely annotation projection, delexicalized transfer, and tree bank translation. Um, Data augmentation for parsing. This was, uh, to me, a quite unexpected uh, use of. So uh, Ding Kuan Wang and Jason Eisner released the galactic dependencies tree banks, where they used statistical models trained on real UD tree banks to generate new languages to provide better support for cross-lingual parsing. Uh, from syntax to semantic. Semantic parsing, universal semantic parsing, thanks to Siva Reddy and colleague, it was essentially a rule-based approach to semantic, very traditional, taking syntax trees, applying rules to derive logical forms. But of course, taking advantage of the fact that the syntax trees were uniform across languages, so one set of rules could be used for multiple languages. Uh, in 2018, we saw the uh, proposal of uh, surface uh, syntactic universal dependencies, which was an alternative um, uh, to UD provided by Kim Gerdes and colleagues, which uh, specifically treats function words as syntactic heads to a much larger um, 
degree than the original UD annotations. And this has now been, this, the UD and SUD now have this symbiotic relationships where uh, resources are annotated in one of the frameworks but then converted to the other, which of course provides more flexibility for users who prefer one style of representation for a particular application. Uh, linguistic typology, I have mentioned, um, uh, it has become more and more popular to use UD resources for data-driven linguistic typology. Here is a paper by Natalia Levshina from 2019, token-based typology in word order entropy. It wasn't, certainly wasn't the first uh, paper on typology using UD resources, but it was one of the earliest that was written by a lingu linguistic typologist rather than an NLP researcher with typological interests. Uh, language model interpretability, I mentioned. Here is an example by my own uh, PhD student, Arder Kulmisev and colleagues, uh, where he used UD resources to do syntactic probing of the multilingual BERT model uh, and see comparing results across different languages. So people had previously done this for English and showed that you can g extract syntactic representations with fairly high accuracy. Uh, Arder showed that um, the accuracy actually varies a lot between different languages in this multilingual model. He also compared UD and SUD um, um, representations and found that BERT seems to like UD better than SUD, whatever that means, it's hard to know. Um, natural language understanding, I mentioned that downstream applications are no longer built the way we used to traditionally build them, but it doesn't rule out that you can use annotated resources to improvement. So here's a paper by uh, Goran Glavas and Ivan Vulic from EACL where they try to use what they call, I think, immediate syntactic pre-training. So between the standard pre-training and the fine-tuning, task-specific fine-tuning of a language model, you could do uh, some supervised uh, syntactic training in order to, um, if you thought that your downstream task uh, required syntactic knowledge. Uh, the results in this paper were mostly negative, I have to say, but uh, who knows? Uh, I'm sure the last word has not been said on this subject. Um, linguistic optimality, the question of whether this is related to typology but not exactly the same. Many people have hypotheses about how natural languages have, through evolution, been optimized in certain ways. Uh, here, uh, Ferreri Cancho and colleagues uh, try to study dependency length minimization. That is, our language, are the grammars of languages organized in such a way that uh, the length, the average length of dependencies are minimized. And they again used resources from both UD and SUD to try to test this hypothesis. Uh, and finally then from this year, uh, a paper on linguistic annotation, uh, more specifically, Parseem meets universal dependencies. So by now, many uh, sort of communities have added additional annotation layers on top of UD data, which of course makes it even more useful. So Parseem is specifically concerned with multi-word expressions. Uh, and these are, uh, and here is a discussion about how these representations can be harmonized better. And those are discussions that in one way or the other will probably continue tomorrow when we have the meeting of the Unidive cost action, which is to a large extent built on uh, initiatives from, from Parseem and UD. All right, so uh, where are we now? Well, on the one hand, I, I think it's uh, um, hard to deny that there, uh, we have made great, great achievements in these 10 years. There has been, as I said, a completely uh, unexpected and amazing growth in terms of both contributors and tree banks. We really had no idea when we started that it would grow into something like this. And I think the survey of research have shown that Data sets are widely used for research in NLP, but increasingly also in linguistics. At the same time, there are challenges, and I think it's important to be uh, honest about that. Uh, data sets are <coughs> uneven in terms of quality and quantity. I focused here on the quantitative aspect, showing that the amount of data varies, that is available varies a lot between language and language families. I think there are also questions of annotation consistency that you could add to that. 
and we're constantly trying to provide better tools for checking the quality of the data. In particular, Dan Zeman, uh, who will be here tomorrow, I guess, uh, it puts in a, a huge effort in uh, the so-called UD validator, trying to add new tests that uh, catches mistakes and so on. Uh, I think the uh, annotation scheme, and perhaps in particular its documentation, can still be improved. We are aware that people often don't know exactly how to annotate the construction because the guidelines are not specific enough. Um, at the same time, you have to keep in mind that UD is a project without any funding. It has never had any dedicated funding. It has been done because people uh, think it's worth doing. And that means that the, the amount of work that you can put into doing things like documentation is somewhat limited. But we're doing what we can. And one of the uh, new policies that I mentioned that we passed last year for trying to improve the annotation scheme is that um, we have introduced the possibility of amendments. So we used to have this idea that UD guidelines could only change holistically at a given time, like from version one to version two. But we have realized that uh, the, the way it has grown now, it's, it's uh, almost impossible now to make a complete overhaul of the guidelines. So we have, but that shouldn't stop us from improving things. So we now have started having, making amendments which are smaller changes which should be well documented so that people can uh, modify their data if they need to. And of course, uh, relevance to the research community cannot be taken for granted at the pace in which NLP is developing. Uh, we, we have seen, as I already talked about, um, um, uh, a dramatic change really in the 10 years that have happened here. You mentioned the SUD community, which is, depending on how you look at it, already a part of UD uh, and which uh, increases the flexibility for users. I haven't talked about the Unimorph project, but that's another project that is developing universal resources more in the form of lexical resources, morphological lexicons for many languages but activities are ongoing to make sure that those can be compatible with UD resources. Parseem has been mentioned as one example of uh, additional annotations. There are others. Uh, and of course, the, the, we're very happy now to have this new cost action called Unidive that, are, that is having a meeting here tomorrow where we can work on, continue to work on some of these integrate, integrating aspects. But I also think we need to reach out to uh, the, the large language model community. So uh, we've been in contact with the OSCAR project, which is a, a project that is in some sense very similar in spirit to UD. It wants to create language resources for as many languages as possible, but it's not annotated resources. It's sort of raw text data that can be used uh, for training language models. But I'm sure there can be synergies between these. So I'll stop there uh, and I'll, I'll end the way I always end uh, when I'm giving a talk on universal dependencies, namely by thanking all the UD contributors without whom UD literally would not exist. Thank you. And I'll be happy to take questions if, if there are. I don't know exactly what... <clears throat> the time constraints are. But. I have a question. Yep. Not directly about the universal dependencies, but uh, what, are, what, are, what are your future projections when you think about these large language models and the research? large, huge uh, models, large language models can be only built by giants, mm -hmm. companies. Mm -hmm. uh, how can we adapt ourselves to the future developments? Mm -hmm. Could we just build these uh, publicly available models or how we can mm -hmm. find other ways to uh, do this? Because mm -hmm. you know, all 
in all good times, you are pr proud must find smart people to work with. Mm. Now, we are chasing the budgets for this professional cost mm. to mm. access mm. large amount of data. Mm. Uh, what are your opinions about that? How we can manage this? <coughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's a it's question that we're all struggling with right now. I mean, I keep telling people, I think the whole NLP community, at least the academic NLP community right now, is in some kind of constant state of shock, where we're also oscillating between euphoria and deep depression, right? I think that's an accurate description of, of how NLP research is here today. Um, I think I think the I, I think the what we need, uh, especially I mean if if we are if we are scientists and academic researchers, we have to uh, continue to take scientific approaches uh, very seriously, and that's increasingly difficult, of course, because as you say, we don't have the resources to reproduce the results. And the results are not reproducible anyway because we don't have access to the data, we don't have access to the models, we don't have access to the codes. I think, uh, and uh, but I think we need to continue to work on making that available. So I think the doing reproducible experiments with models that are available, whether it is models that we as academics uh, have developed ourselves, which will. Uh, the current state in time be not as powerful and not as large as the other ones or models that have been made available because i mean it's it's not a i mean the landscape is is diversified in that respect as well some of the big tech companies are don't release anything currently but others do and so on so uh i think it's um, it's 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 hard to see exactly how this will play out but I think if we lose sight of that, that we are scientists and try to study these techniques using scientific methods, then I, I think we will be in even worse trouble. Um, yep. Yeah. So, uh, so is the to take your specific example is the is is the problem there that the the, the co-referring units are not complete words but rather parts of words. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I mean, first of all, there are sort of workarounds for this within UD. People have been very creative in 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 creating, uh, especially using uh, this so-called miscellaneous column of the where you can encode special things but of course it's not ideal uh, so I think um, I, I think it probably points well I think there are two ways of, of looking at this I mean for for sort of rich agglutinating languages and polysynthetic languages I mean maybe we need maybe the current way of thinking about what a word is in UD terms is not quite right maybe we actually need to do uh, a kind of segmentation there and I think this uh, and this idea this issue about how do you apply maybe we shouldn't say that it's word maybe we should say, say that it's word like entities or something like that and how can we make that more precise and come up with better guidelines so that we can come up with a more principled way of doing the segmentation for this language so that's actually an issue that is being pursued in this new unidive uh, effort so there's been a survey uh, going around um, recently where people, well, especially people who have experience of UD have been asked to document uh, the principles that are used for word segmentation in their language and any problems and issues with that. Um, so, so, I th so I think we need to do more work there. Um, uh, 
the other thing that is, is happening in parallel is that, of course, there have been proposals for how you can, at least for the languages that uh, where it's possible, do a subword segmentation as well, and have those entities uh, uh, present in the representations, uh, and 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 even have relations between them, because that's the thing right now. I mean. What all you can do about things that are below the word level are features, and you can and they and the features don't tell you where in the word uh, they are realized. So there was a um, Dogstool seminar earlier this year where one of the working groups uh, uh, tried to work out guidelines for how you could uh, represent this subword segmentation. It's still a little bit unclear how it should be incorporated in the current version of UD. Some people think it could be done in the enhanced dependencies because there the guidelines are not as strict. I personally don't think that's a good idea. I think that would be just another workaround. So I think we need to, to, to think about ways of possibly incorporating this in a future version three of the UD guidelines. I'm not sure that was an answer, but it was some thoughts anyway. Are you talking about syntactic ambiguity or? Or, 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 in or, or indeterminacy? I mean, I mean, that there are. Indeterminacy. Indeterminacy, right? Yeah. So, so there is not enough information to decide which. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. So that's, I, I think that's, um, th that's a more general problem that, that all traditional annotation schemes uh, sort of um, have to deal with because the, um, uh, the um, what should I say? I mean, the, the basic assumption is that there will always be enough information, even though ambiguities and, and indeterminacy and all these exist in language, there will always be enough information in the context so that you can resolve it and have a single annotation. Uh, and, and, and that's the current assumption. If that's not the case, what would you like to do instead? Would you like to have multiple trees for the same sentence? Or would you like to have some underspecified version of the representation that uh, generalizes over several possible Okay. Not the same mm -hmm. uh, diagram. Mm -hmm. No problem. Mm -hmm. I want to ask if there is provision for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Th there is no. Uh, there is no technical solution. I mean, obviously, if if you're doing, if you're building a test set for parser evaluation, you could. Um, of, I mean, in principle, it would be straightforward to include multiple analysis for a sentence and say that as long as the system produces one of these, it's going to be counted as correct. I mean, people have done that for, in other contexts, like uh, in machine translation, for example, or in, uh, in alignment and so. Um, there isn't a technical way of implementing that in UD currently, but I think that would be a relatively simple extension. And of course, if you were to do it for a specific project, you could, you could do it uh, yourself. But, um. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in terms of uh, quantity and quality of writing, which is uh, an industry, mm -hmm. uh, do, do you think it would be interesting you know, when we annotate um, a corpus with human, you know, human annotation? Yeah. Uh, obviously, that takes a long time. You have to train annotators mm -hmm. and lots of effort. Mm -hmm. And there, some of the tree banks are human annotated, mm -hmm. others are converted, mm -hmm. and others are automatically produced. So I, I, I keep wondering if mm -hmm. there are any way of separating those to get, get interesting, or we just have to deal with uh, these varieties. 
Yeah. What, what, what do you mean by separating? I mean, do you mean as a user when you want to make use of the data? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. That, that's already been done. Yeah, so ah. it, it's part of the documentation. Uh, I mean, again, it's fairly coarse grained, but, it, but, it, but it's part of the documentation of each tree bank, whether it was manually annotated from scratch, whether it was uh, automatically converted and manually corrected, or automatically converted without manual. So, so there are like five or six different cases. So, so if, you, if you are concerned that you don't want to use tree banks that have only been automatically converted, yeah. Perfect. There is a way of filtering those out, yes. And then can you put, for example, on the list, uh, have a single and kind of, you know, flash, oh, this is minimally <laughs> checked. Well, there, there, is the, there is the infamous or famous star rating. I don't know if you know that. There is a star rating for each tree bank. You can have get up to five stars. And only Dan Zimmer knows the secret formula for <laughs> oh, what <okay>. determines. <laughs> uh, but, but clearly, having manually validated annotation, uh, without that, you will not get any stars. Then, then you will probably have close to zero. And then it's, there are a couple of other factors, like, uh, I don't know, uh, well, Dan will be here tomorrow. We can talk, we, we can uh, uh, buy him a beer and see if he can get more stars. No, but uh, anyway, the size, obviously, because for most applications, bigger is better, so. Much for everything. We can't finish the questions, so that uh, we are waiting for the cocktail. Okay. And we may continue there. Right.